Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Our guest is with a unique organization based in Roanoke, Building Beloved Communities, which is dedicated to helping small businesses grow. Bonnie Chavez is the founder and chief executive officer for BBC. Shannon Dominguez is the director of operations in Virginia. And by the way, the first repeat guest on Business Matters. Welcome to both of you. Thanks. It's great to be here. First but repeat guest. I right, like that. Right. <laughs> well, you, the first time you were on was about being a mother, dealing with everything going on, working mom. You're still a working mm -hmm. mom, daughter sitting over there. Um, well, Bonnie, let's start out with you, sure. building beloved communities. Talk about your your journey from a Fortune 10 healthcare company to building beloved communities, and talk about what made you realize that what you really wanted to do was help small businesses and, and nonprofits grow. Sure. No, thank you for the question. It was a really wonderful experience working in corporate America because I was able to learn scale and scope and economies of scale, which is huge and being able to network and really understand the industry, the healthcare industry. And then I just wasn't there. There, I mean, there was some decisions made and I, I kind of had this achy conscience about it. And so from there, I just was looking for a way to use my education, my experience, and really help my community because yes, I've, I've volunteered before. And you know, yes, I've worked on boards and you know, been on the front lines with some nonprofits, but I really wanted to have greater impact. And I didn't know what that looked like. And so uh, many an evening at our local pub, I was writing a business plan uh, in a notebook and trying to get all the thoughts out. And then eventually, due to a business merger, I was laid off and I had the business plan pretty much written and decided why the heck not and went with it. And that's how it has started on a little more than a napkin. I would say it was a notebook and here we are. Mm. I'm wondering, do you, in, you know, in your journeys through that corporate life and all that, did you come across other people that maybe had some of the same ambitions that you did to do something different but just couldn't break out of that mold? Yeah, I would say I did. I met a lot of phenomenal individuals who I'm still in contact with today who are really working on the philanthropic side, who are you know trying to lead their corporate giving, who are trying to really cultivate their volunteer time off programs, some strategies that you know we use today in building beloved communities, but it's great. Mm. Yeah. I'm wondering if you think that more people would m maybe stay in the corporate environment if, if they're, and I think a lot of corporations do, but if they're, their company really nurtured some of that outside interest where they could get involved with corporate things or even as a side hustle or something, help businesses grow, that type of thing. I, it's true. I mean, that's how we can really help small businesses keep the employees that they have, especially now, and attract new talent. Because if you had to choose between one job that's a job and another job that allows you to fulfill your passion of volunteering at, let's say, the animal shelter and taking care of kids you know, and get paid for it, or being able to run a really great program to put shoes on kids in need, mm -hmm. I think many people might make a different choice. Shannon, I see you agreeing, you sort of, if, if you could bring some more of that feeling out, if we could lift, <laughs> lift more boats? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, putting shoes on children's feet, that's one of the first projects I was able to work on coming- With Fleet Feet. Yeah, exactly, and their nonprofit, Project Forward, mm -hmm. And they, they're working with Roanoke City Public Schools to put a pair of shoes on the 8,000 students who have been identified as economically disadvantaged. And being able to work, I mean, that's a different feel. You know yeah. you're doing something good right here in your community, and that it changes how you work and how you feel about the work that you're doing. And I know I talked to Robin Lewis about Project Forward, and they, that, they had been, they had, that had been in place for some number of years, but, but they feel that working with BBC really kind of helped them get to the next level. It's about visibility in a lot of cases. Yeah, it definitely is. And it's also, you know, a big project. 8,000 kids, you know, the warehouse for that, the organizing of fitting the shoes. And sometimes you need someone who has experience running those projects to come in, set up the bones, set up the procedures, set up the processes so that it can become something that hopefully is annually. Mm -hmm. 
and self-sustaining. Exactly. Um, talk about the name, Building Beloved Communities, Bonnie, where that came from, the inspiration for that, uh, for that name. Thank you. It's, it was from Dr. Martin Luther King's 1967 speech. It was a Christmas Eve speech, a, servant, a sermon actually. And he talked about a beloved community and what that really meant. And the King Foundation has then further expanded that definition. And it really is a world without poverty, without homelessness, without hunger, without racism. And if you think about what that world would look like, I thought, I'm on board with that. Like, how can I contribute? How can one person contribute to that huge vision? And silly, of course, it takes an entire community. So mm -hmm. that's how I built the business model, is working with nonprofits that want to solve these issues and small businesses specifically who want to contribute and support their nonprofits in their community and the people in their community. Mm -hmm. And talk about how a small business ecosystem, if you will, can really help build that community. Sure, it's impact and it's visibility. You have a local restaurant that everybody loves and then they start donating every Tuesday to you know a nonprofit. You have Fleet Feet, for example, that's making sure shoes are on needy kids' feet. And it's really aligning with what do they do well and how can they use that operational efficiency to give back to their community? Like really just aligning with their business, their values and what they're good at. You know, I wouldn't ask, you know, a shoe store, for example, to, to make pizzas and sell them, you know, that would just not work out for them. Yeah. But because of they have all these relationships with suppliers, they have economies of scale, they have all these big, you know, concepts of business and boom, they have a successful community event. Mm -hmm. Uh, i.e. with Fleet Feet, um, I know Robin said they were working with their suppliers that were selling them shoes at below cost, an older model or something, but it helps uh, when you have credibility. When Absolutely. they could say Project Forward is credibility, and that's what sure. you guys are helping build, that credibility for some of these nonprofits? I mean, yeah, and, and Fleet Feet already has great credibility, but it's getting that focus on their nonprofit, on Project Forward, what are they doing, why are they doing it, how are they doing it, how is it creating an impact? And the relationships that's been made just in the past two months, you know, we were able to raise $150,000 right here in Roanoke in 60 days. Um, and that is because businesses, churches, and individuals have all stepped up due to promoting Project Forward, letting people know what it is yeah. and what we're doing. And other nonprofits like um, Latinas Network, you know, we've had the opportunity to work with them. Cat Pascal saw a need pulled in people who are like-minded and are now has a group of i think it's over 900 now mm -hmm. on on facebook and these are uh, latina owned businesses or some in some yeah to some extent? the organization is really about supporting latina women because there was no support system for latina women so whether you're a business owner or you're selling mary Kay, or you're a real estate agent a banker whatever your profession is this is a place where you can come and get support. So we have people of all nationalities, races, um, you know, males, females. It d you don't have to be a Latina to come as long as you want to support Latinas. Mm -hmm. yep. When you're in a small business or a small nonprofit, uh, Bonnie, how, how much is support? You know, like-minded people, <laughs> how, how big is that? It's everything because, you know, you have hardworking individuals with incredible missions and impossible tasks and a budget the size of a shoestring. Or you have great nonprofits with great missions, great budget, but no way to make it last. And so having individuals in the community just step up to volunteer, to say hello, uh, to donate money, to donate time, or to have a corporate partner for the long term, it's everything. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing, like we love matching up corporations, small businesses with nonprofits so that they have a sustainable partner that they can rely on, like a large volunteer force, uh, donations, time, serving on boards. It's critical. Uh, you, you, your, your operation space here and also in New Mexico, correct? Yep. Where you're, you're a native new, from New Mexico. What have you found here in the Roanoke area as far as corporate receptivity to working with small nonprofits? Sure. I feel it's people are incredibly generous. Small businesses have, I've noticed a mindset where they're like, well, we're not big enough. We can't make that big of an impact. And I really feel like 
having that mindset shift is really important. They're, they're realizing, oh yeah, I can do this. I can support these individuals. I can make an, a difference. And if I partner with someone who has a similar um, business or complementary business, we can double our impact. So they're really seeing the work and seeing the impact, so it's great. And one thing you told me before was that micro donations can have a collective impact. Oh, heck yeah. If you get 100 people to donate a dollar, that's 100 bucks, right? But or one person to donate $50. $50. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you really think about it, if you multiply that, it amplifies and people get excited and people want to partner and they want to get involved and then pretty yeah. soon it's this wonderful snowball avalanche effect of goodness and kindness and people just saying, here, how can I help? Because right, I think even in the Roanoke area, there's still a fairly small layer of people, maybe I'm wrong, that donate. 25, 50 bucks. I mean, m is it growing? I would say, based on my experience, people have been very generous. Yeah, there's <laughs> been three to 400 people who have come together to donate for the Back to School Shoes project in 60 days. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is just a glimpse at what's possible to happen here in Roanoke. Right. Yeah. And to me, if you could make more people, like, I don't have a lot of money, but I'll give a little bit of money here and there. Sure. I'll do that all year long. And uh, if you could if you get to the point where people can realize that even if they give ten, fifteen dollars, sure. if you can get fifty thousand people to do that, that can help some nonprofits or small businesses keep the doors open. Exactly. exactly. Totally. We need more genes in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you, I don't think you want to go there. <laughs> you know, and when you were asking about corporations, we've been able to make some connections with corporations who have two, three, four hundred employees and they pay their employees to volunteer. So you take 300 employees who are paid 16 hours a year, that can create huge change yeah. in our community because with all of these nonprofits, there are so many volunteer opportunities. And if you have a corporation who's willing to step in and facilitate that by making sure that their employees are being paid, it makes a huge right. difference. And those person hours mean a lot to some of these small businesses that need volunteers. You know, Shannon Dominguez, you were, the, you were formerly the dir Director of Development of the Advancement Foundation. You also helped run the, the Gauntlet Competition. Um, you spent time with more than 100 entrepreneurs doing that. Um, spent a lot of time helping to promote these people. How, how has that experience, Shannon, transferred to what you're doing now with Building Beloved Communities? Well, it's definitely given me a wide perspective of different businesses, different entrepreneurs, different people just how people work differently. And all of that comes together to piece into what feels like a more comprehensive view. And I'm learning every day because there's always new businesses, new people, new concepts. And that's something that I love is to continue to learn and grow. But having those relationships has, has I would say, given me a comprehensive view of what entrepreneurship and small business, owning a small business, what the realities of that are, what are their challenges, um, what things come easy to some but come more difficult to others, and how can I pair those people so that they can work together as a team? What are some, there's gotta be some common threads through a lot of, what are the common threads for a lot of these small businesses? You know, what obstacles are they putting in, are they putting in their way? And how many of them are, are, are self-made? Um, I mean, I would definitely say most are self-made and the most common obstacle that I see is self-limiting beliefs. A lot of people fall into entrepreneurship. You know, they don't, they don't start at 18 and go, well, by the time I'm 25, I want to have this restaurant or I want to have this. They end up finding a passion somewhere in life, make a job transition, have an opportunity to come up, find themselves as an entrepreneur. And the most common thread that I see is that the thought of, am I enough? Mm. Am I doing it right? Is this how it's supposed to be done? I think we all want some type of guide or manual. So what we like to do is step in and reassure them, yes, this is the game plan, and make sure that they're taking the action items because sometimes it's your own fear of failing that can hold you back from allowing your business to really grow and prosper. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to see, get, get them to see that vision where they're going. And believe it. You know, because a lot of times it's like, well, do, I, I don't have this. We all think we need this magical thing in order to be successful. But really, people are out there making it happen. I mean, I think yeah. of like Kat Pascal and yeah. Jimmy Delgado with Farm Sure. Yeah. You know, look at, it's so wildly popular now, but I'm sure three years ago, they didn't realize what, what it could be. But mm. they, they had a vision, they stuck with it, they have action items, they have a great team that they work with and train, and 
they're making it happen. Yeah. Do a lot of good work with social media too. Mm -hmm. And nonprofits. Nonprofit, right, right. The, you can go there if they get once a week and they'll support a nonprofit, a part of their proceeds. How, how much is uh, social media for some of these companies you work with a big thing for companies that don't have an advertising budget? Sure, I think it's super important. It's, it's one of the low cost, uh, smallest barriers to entry. It really helps you promote your business. It helps you promote, you know, the good that you're doing in the world. And it also like showcases like what your needs are and what you're trying to do in, in the world, right? Like if you need hiring or if you need, you know, we're looking for someone who's fantastic in this or, you know, we've done some really great work in this field. Uh, we got an advancement or a new technology. It's really great to mm -hmm. just talk about it. And I mean, you got to brag about your business. And I'm really bad at it. And that's why I have <laughs> Shannon, uh, because she's really I good. I think at she's afraid of bragging. <laughs> <laughs> she's really good at, you know, talking about the highlights for building beloved communities. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, I, that's one of the things that I struggle with. And that's exactly what she said, is finding those people that complement your skills and what you do really well, and I mean, she does that, and so I'm so, so grateful that she's here. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you're building your business at the same time yeah. you're trying to help other people build business. You met Shannon through the Advancement Foundation, the Gauntlet, yeah. and um, what did you learn out of the Gauntlet? I know we talked previously, and you talked about having to check your ego, but what did you learn from the Gauntlet that maybe helped you refocus your, what you need to sure, do? Sure, sure. I think um, I had the luxury of, of have been in business for a year, uh, so that was the first thing. The second thing is that I was able to really mentor other business owners, and they gave me some phenomenal ideas for my business, which, you know, Mentoring has them at the Advancement Foundation? Yes, the at, at the Gauntlet. Okay. So, like, we were peers, and then I would give them uh, advice or merchandising. Uh, I mean, we got to do all kinds of really great, fun things. And it was really wonderful to see the new businesses that were sprouting up in Roanoke and helping them and supporting them. And also, they gave me some ideas that I had never thought of because they were in different industry. I was in consulting, one was in retail, and I had some great ideas from them, and vice versa. And I think also seeing Shannon work and seeing how hard she could hustle and um, deciding that once I had the ability uh, and, and had the contracts and the financial stability to do so, I was like, I need to make a hire. And she was on the top of my list. Mm -hmm. Yay! <laughs> Lucky me. Um, and I would like to plug in that Bonnie was like star gauntlet participant <laughs> because she really helped me to create an equitable platform by stepping up and mentoring so many. I mean, we didn't have a lot of participants who were mentoring other participants. So when I saw that, that just really aligned with what I believe in, creating those equitable pal um, platforms, making sure that people who just need an extra hand have that mentorship available to them. Mm. One of the things I know you want to do with building beloved communities is, uh, is help, uh, help women business owners in particular, maybe people of color. Sure. Talk about that, and I know one of the things you told me that you, you want the uh, women business owners to help overcome the patriarchy. Oh yeah. Talk about that <laughs> a little bit. Heck yeah. So and be gentle. Oh, okay, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, it's the. So when I was in, when I was a young woman in business, uh, it was very difficult because I was the youngest, I was a minority, and I'm a lesbian, and I just didn't. Everyone in the boardroom did not look like me, and I felt it was very much um, standoffish in a way. Like other people had mentors that could help them or introduce them to other people or gave them job opportunities or at least let them know about that. And it was really hard. So I really had to push my way in and ask people, hey, can you, can you talk to me about some stuff? And one of the things I decided was, well, I want to be the mentor that wasn't there for me. You know? So I really started cultivating individuals that were in other departments in corporate America in, the, in those jobs to, you know, hey, let's have coffee as a director of a completely different <laughs> you know, uh, section and saying, you know, what are your goals and aspirations? What would you like to do? What jobs are you looking for? You know, let's do a gap analysis on your education and experience and fill those gaps so you get to the next level. And it was really just mentoring and finding out what that takes. And then as I became a, a professional coach, I started really loving to work with women, specifically women of color, because there's some unique challenges that we face. And it can be anything from a language barrier, because English is also my second language, but also how do we navigate not only the workforce, but balancing family and other cultural things that you know we are also held responsible for. And then you know the unique perspective of being a woman. You know, being a woman in business is tricky at, at 
at the easiest, but it's also very rewarding because we have a unique opportunity to be leaders, uh, to show and hold the door open for others behind us, and really get inspiration from other people in business to see how can we do things better. Mm -hmm. I know you talked about you want women to be empowered to make their own decisions about their careers, their education, and their economic empowerment. Sure. And is, is that something that a lot of women, you have to tell to these women that it's okay to do this? So, you know, sometimes most women already know it. Some women, you just have to say, yeah, it's cool to be awesome. Like, it's, it's fine to take ownership. It's fine to be considered brash. It's fine to be someone's shot of whiskey and not everyone's cup of tea. It's absolutely fine to be who you are. Mm -hmm. And be authentic, lean into it, be that person. Because there is a little girl out there looking at you saying how awesome you are. Mm. I mean, think about how we all felt when Wonder Woman came out, came out on the big screen and all these, these women got to see their action hero. And think about how Kamala Harris is being the vice president of this great country. Like, that's a lot. We get to see women in positions that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. And so that's very inspiring and I want to continue that trend. I'm wondering with, with the whole COVID thing, mm -hmm. Bonnie and, and Shannon, has that delayed some plans for people, especially maybe women-owned businesses or, 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 or businesses owned by people of color. Has that sort of pushed things back a little bit? Are there special obstacles those types of businesses had to overcome? Man, I feel like it's given them the opportunity. Like, I see so many women taking advantage of opportunities where maybe before they didn't s think it was possible or didn't see that happening for themselves as soon. But COVID comes and everything changes and opens up a lot of doors. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, how, how much, but you know, again, it's the, you have to have the confidence to hire somebody. Sure. You have to spend money to make money in some cases sure. and to take that leap. Sure. I think it's just that entrepreneurial spirit, like those individuals and those, those people that just say, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And, and so a lot of distractions were taken out of the way. So I, yeah. s I saw a lot of people like starting that side hustle and then it's grown, especially since there's so much being done online. Mm -hmm. So you've got more downtime. People are investing that time. Maybe they're going back to school. Maybe they're working on, you know, making jewelry on the side. And then that starts to grow to a point where they can see, wow, this is something I could actually do to sustain me fi financially. Mm -hmm. Would you say there's something unique about your business model? Totally. I think it's business consulting, but with a greater good in mind, number one. Uh, number two, we as Building Beloved Communities give back to our community as well. So we practice what we advise our clients to do. And also, it's fun. It's really fun to go to work and realize the impact or what we helped facilitate and grow. Like, when we did Project Forward, it was a Saturday and I was running a shoe scan to fit kids, to get their shoes. And you know, then they would go to the next station, the next station. But at the end, the very end, I got to see them skipping out of the door in brand new shoes with socks and bags. And it was just like, that is exactly why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you work on contract basis as well? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. What is the hardest part for a nonprofit, a small nonprofit that wants to get off the ground? What's the hardest thing that they, they face? Is it defining what their mission is or finding their niche or wh what do you think? They usually know what their mission yeah. is. They're usually very concrete in what they're passionate about. Um, probably figuring out the next steps. Like, I'm mm -hmm. passionate about this. Yeah. I've applied for my 501c3. Sure. Now what? Right. You know, how do you grow and expand? What does that look like? Exactly. And I think having a business mindset to run a nonprofit because it takes yeah. money to run a nonprofit. You need money to pay staff, deliver materials, help and support your community. Uh, I would say go in with the mindset that you are here to make money, not for money's sake, but to grow and expand right. your community. And I think that's a mindset that some small nonprofits really don't have. They don't think like a business. They think, Sure. We're, we're doing this for the greater good, but they really need to think more like a business. Yeah, and then the longer, the, the sooner they start that, the longer and more successful and more impactful their nonprofit will be. The greater their good can be yeah. once they operate like a business. And it is a mindset yeah. transition. A lot of nonprofits have that scarcity mindset. Right. You can still have an abundant mindset sure. and be a nonprofit. In fact, that is the key to 
having the greater good, to having the more meaningful and bigger impact is running your nonprofit like a business. Yeah. It is a business. It is. We have about a minute left. I was wondering if you guys could chime in. What's the one piece of advice you'd give people who want to start a small business? The best piece of advice. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Don't do wait. You're passionate about it. Do it. It makes you happy. Do it. Don't. No excuses. You should have started yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm and I'm really glad that you're having this conversation with me. You should have started yesterday. Have you talked with have, have, have businesses you've worked with told you that? Man, I should have done this six months ago or a year ago, two years ago. You would be surprised. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how can people find out about you guys if they want to find out more about BBC? Find us on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> so building beloved communities. We try to keep active on our Facebook. That's our big connector right now. Mm -hmm. We're working on our website and exciting to excited to launch that soon. And then Bonnie at Building Beloved Communities, Shannon at buildingbelovedcommunities.com. All right. Well, yeah. we're going to have to leave it there, ladies. Uh, Bonnie Chavez and Shannon Dominguez from Building Beloved Communities. Uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you. I'm Thank Gene you. Morano. This has been Business Matters, and have a great day. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.